I, I find it to be a very dark. I, I'd, I'd say the panpsychists are getting warm. They yeah, yeah, from, that's right. They've moved from, they moved from the simplistic materialism that has dominated science, philosophy, and the academy, and much of culture for the last hundred years. And they're saying, no, there's there's a third fundamental reality. Mm. There's matter, there's energy. What in science, I, I think people are coming to is there's a th third fundamental reality in the sense that there's mind, or, sorry, there's 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 matter, there's energy, and there's information. Information, yeah, I've heard. And I, some of what the we know from that. our experience, which is the basis of all scientific reasoning, is that information always comes from a mind. That's right. Uh, and and then I think you get into a more philosophical discussion uh, with pan panentheists, panpsychists. And mm -hmm. others want to say that mind is is fundamental or or a fundamental reality or straight up idealists who want to deny the materiality of the world. Uh, and I, I think there the Judeo-Christian uh, worldview has the balance right. That matter and energy are real. Space and time are real. But so is information. In the beginning, after all, was the word. Mm -hmm. This idea yeah. biblically. Um, and, and even when you were talking about the Genesis account, I'm again stipulating Theory of intelligent design is not based on a reading of Genesis, but it is interesting to me as a person who's both an intelligent design theorist and also uh, um, a, a religious believer that the, the biblical text in the creation account repeatedly says, uh, affirms that, and God said. The agent of creation is is the word. It is yeah. information. But not just that. It's more than yeah. that because God says, yeah. God's, God sees, and God evaluates. That's what he does during all of Genesis 1. Interesting. And so Interesting. that's what mind is. Mind is basically giving a pattern of constraint, right? And then, let's say, calling that the multiplicity into that constraint and evaluating the distance between the participation and the constraint. Like, that's how we live. That's how all our that's, lives that's are made. That's interesting, Jonathan. Yeah, he's taking, he's taking stock of information, or he's taking in information to take stock of a situation and then acts accordingly by imparting and for new yeah, information. By, by evaluating saying that it is good it's like yeah. you know naming yeah. evaluating and then judging it's like that's actually that is the greatest way of understanding mind and i think like you said you know it's like a very simplistic uh story that can be read at a very simple level but there's some there are very profound things going on there from the standpoint of oh yeah uh, philosophy engineering science uh uh, epistemology, yeah, very interesting. Yeah. I, I definitely think that Genesis one is the best account of the origin of the world. It just happens to not be a scientific account. It, it's a it's an account of the origin of the world in meaning, and how mind and meaning are the source of reality, and then everything else is downstream from that from that description. Uh, oh, but I was wanted to say, based on what you said of the the kind of materialist scientists, when I hear them saying something like there's energy, matter, and information, it's like my mind is just flaring up because like you said, information is active constraint. Yes. You know, and so if you don't, so if you don't where, like where mind- Where does the that, constraint come from? It begs the most important- Yeah. You're right there. Like you're right next to it. If you don't yeah, like it, that- It elicits mind, the most right important question, it. right? And see in the 19th century, late 19th century, there was the assumption you could understand everything in, by reference to matter and energy operating within space and time. And we realized late 20th century, uh, neither in biology nor in physics nor in other fields can you understand what's going on, but especially not in biology can you understand what's going on apart from a third fundamental entity, and that is information. And you're right, information implies, uh, logically it implies a constraining agent, but empirically, we know from our experience that information always comes from in, an intelligent source. Yeah. Even, by the way, Jonathan, in these origin of life experiments, I don't know if you've seen any of the, the uh, videos online of James Tour, the, uh, the um, organic chemist from Rice University, he's been critiquing these guys who do what are called prebiotic simulation experiments. They're trying to simulate how the first cell could have arisen from some kind of prebiotic environment through a series of, of chemical, uh, undirected chemical interactions or reactions. And what Tour shows, and which many people working in origin of life research actually know, but don't want to lead with, is that at each step along the way to get the chemicals, the simple chemicals to move in the direction of more complex and biologically relevant chemistry, 
constraints have to be applied from outside the system by right. the prebiotic simulator himself. I know, I know, that's hilarious. Like even okay. if they get to it, like even if they would actually do it, it means that they've completely constrained everything to be exactly yeah. in the right place for it to happen. It's hilarious. So, so here's a big question, okay? If these experiments are simulation experiments, What's being simulated? If at every step along the way, you need There's an intelligence. agent to restrict degrees of chemical freedom to move in a life relevant direction, what are you simulating must have occurred on the early earth? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The same thing, right? Yeah, you true. must have, there must have been a, a intelligence playing a role. So even the prebiotic simulation experiments of the chemical evolutionary theorists are inadvertently reaffirming the principle that it takes intelligence to generate information. Because yeah. every one of those con constraints can be uh, rendered as a quantifiable input of information. And in fact, it even gets more specific than that. There are experiments called ribozyme engineering experiments, where the, 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 there's a particular origin of life theory called the RNA world, where the idea is that the first molecule was an RNA world that stored information and could also act as a catalyst of some kind, kind of like, but not really like a protein. That's the theory. And, and so there are experiments trying to develop RNA molecules that have the capacity to copy themselves. But to build RNA molecules that have even a limited capacity to copy themselves, and the best we've been able to do in the lab is get about a, a molecule that could copy about 10% of itself, the ribozyme engineer has to literally engineer the sequence of letters on the RNA molecule, the nucleotide bases, in a very specific way to get a molecule that has this limited self-replicating capability. Mm. So yes, now you have a molecule that can partially replicate itself, which is therefore a little bit more possibly life relevant down the road. It's just one step along the way, along the way of many that will be needed, but at least it's going in the right direction. But how did you get that? How did you accomplish that step? An intelligent ribozyme engineer, I kid you not, that's what they're called. Mm -hmm input information into the RNA molecule in order to, um, uh, to, to, to move it in that life, life friendly, life tropic direction. So what are you simulating? You're simulating the need for intelligence to generate information. Yeah. The very thing that intelligent design advocates have been saying is the basis of, of our design inference that we know you need you, to get information. You need a mind since there is information present in the cell. There must've been a mind active. Yeah. I, I think that that your example is an amazing example of what I often seem to be the problem at the outset, which is the scientists ignoring their place in the system and acting yes, as if they're exactly just transparent, right. exactly. these weird, transparent, you know, I don't know what exactly, or like kind of these disincarnated gods that are, that are just doing these experiments when in fact, the very, even, even the very act of looking and constraining, even the experiment itself is already an act of constraint, like the limiting of phenomena to one phenomena that I will isolate and, and identify and analyze, then the capacity to write that in a book and to tell other people about it and to then, you know, like educate others, like everything you're doing is in mind and you're telling me that mind is an illusion as you're using mind to do all the things that you're Doing you, to tell me you, mind you is an illusion. This, this happens in the simulation of the origin of the or the the modeling of the origin of the universe by physicists called quantum cosmologists. Uh, they end up postulating a pre-existing mathematical state out of which matter somehow arose. But even with the the equations that they postulate, they have to manipulate them to get an answer that will indicate that our universe is possible. So the manipulation of the mathematical apparatus involves an imparting of information that's coming from the minds of the physicists. The chemical evolutionary theorists do it and forget that they are the the the, yeah. the man behind the curtain doing all the important. Uh, constraints of the chemistry to get things to move in the in the right direction. Um, yeah, so so uh, every attempt to explain the origin of interesting aspects of our physical universe apart from intelligence ends up inadvertently uh, reaffirming the importance of intelligence and the origin of those features. Mm -hmm.